Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, the, to this place, which is Villa Il Gioiello, the house where Galileo spent the last years of his life. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce the ceremony for the uh, Galileo Galilea, Galilei Medal Award, and uh, especially in this place, which is really evocative. There are places uh, where people and the events of the past are interconnected, and uh, this is one of these. And also, not only the villa, but also the surroundings. Uh, the villa stands on the hill of Arcetri, uh, where uh, scientists are working in uh, several institutions. The one on the left is the Department of Physics and Astronomy of the University of Florence, and uh, the Galileo Galilei Institute for Theoretical Physics of the INFN. Then you find the National Institute of Optics and the Arcetri Astrophysical Observatory. So uh, it's clear that uh, all the scientists in this place uh, make uh, uh, still alive the possibility to connect with uh, Galileo. Uh, the Galileo house is just uh, uh, up the hill on the right. Um, uh, okay. uh, the hill of Arcetri was also, you can also find uh, in, a, in a fresco by Giorgio Vasari and Giovanni Stradano in Palazzo Vecchio, and you see that, uh, surprisingly, is not very different from now. Okay, it, it was maintained uh, uh, as it was a century, a uh, very century ago. Uh, for the historic uh, uh, tradition and uh, scientific tradition, uh, the Arcetri Hill was uh, nominated historical science site by the European Physical Society in 2012. Uh, the place where the uh, physics department and the Galileo Galilei Institute uh, works now, work now uh, was, uh, used to be the, the building where the, the Instituto di Fisica was founded 100 years ago. Also, Villa Gioiello, you are here now, is national mo monument till 1920. And it's here that uh, Galileo completed the dialogue, dialogue <laughs> on two new science, uh, and uh, after the sentence of the tribunal of the early office, he was here confined uh, under guard. Although Galileo was confined, he received the visits of friends and men of science, uh, and during the last period of his life, he used to spend plenty of time with uh, Vincenzo Viviani, and Evangelista Torricelli following their conversations with great attention and vivacity. So it's not surprising that uh, in the same places where the scientific method was developed, institutes for high level research uh, and advanced studies were born, uh, such as the Galileo Institute for Theoretical Physics. It, was, uh, it is a research hub, maybe Many of you know uh, what the GGI is, uh, also because many of you were contributed a lot in the formation of the, of the GGI. Uh, it's a research hub devoted to theoretical physics. Uh, it is dedicated to organizing and hosting uh, long-term programs uh, and PhD schools uh, to foster breakthroughs in the fundamental understanding of uh, the universe, the topics, uh, of the GGI activities cover string theories, particle phenomenology, astroparticles, cosmology, statistical mechanics, nuclear and theoretical physics, and related uh, topics. What is important is that the spirit of the GGI activity is to favor discussions and to stimulate collaborations thanks to the environment where uh, the GGI is uh, uh, constructed and the facilities. Uh, before the pandemic, <laughs> more than 800 scientists are hosted, were hosted at the GGI. Uh, we are restarting now every year, and uh, thus confirm 
uh, the e-status as a reference point in the high-level training and research. In the 2018, uh, the GGI was established as uh, Centro Nazionale di Studi Avanzati, National Center for Advanced Study, Studies of the INFN, in partnership with the University of Florence. And uh, when the GGI was established as National Center, uh, INFN created the Galileo Galilei Medal Award in honor of the founding father of the scientific method and uh, of modern physics. Uh, the medal is assigned every two years by a special selection committee uh, to one or more scientists who in the 25 years before the date of the award have achieved outstanding results in uh, theoretical physics. Uh, the first recipient of the first edition, which was in 2019, uh, was Juan Martin Maldacena for his groundbreaking ideas in theoretical physics uh, and especially for the discovery of duality between gravity and ordinary quantum field theory. With almost one year of delay because of the COVID pandemic, uh, I'm really happy and honored uh, to open the ceremony for the 2021 Galileo Galilei Medal Award. I'd like to thank the selection committee, Graciela Gelmini, Valerie Rubakov, Gabriele Veneziano, and Edward Winton, and uh, on top of all uh, them, Michael Peskin, who is here, and uh, he accepted my invitation, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, host him. And also, I'd like to thank the University of Florence and the INFN for supporting the GGI, and all the scientists who have been contributing to X success. So, thank you very much uh, for being here, and uh, I leave the microphone and the floor to the president of INFN, Antonio Zoccoli. Okay, thank you very much Stefania and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, ceremony which is organized within uh, the ceremony which is uh, during for over one year about the 70th birthday of INFN. So it's a long history where INFN had a big contribution to in this research field of particle and fundamental physics. And uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, INFN decided uh, to create uh, this uh, Galileo Galileo Institute for Theoretical Physics because uh, theory is a, a fundamental part uh, of all uh, our activities. And uh, we need uh, even more now the contribution of uh, uh, theorists uh, in order to give us uh, the way to follow with our experiments. And uh, is uh, it's a pleasure to host you here. And uh, as uh, we, we were discussing before uh, with Stefania, and uh, I was discussing what I should say in this occasion. And I was complaining about the weather because uh, we could have made a, a better work. But uh, he replied to me, she replied to me that uh, this is due to the fact I didn't allocate enough budget to her. <laughs> so I have to promise uh, that I will increase the budget uh, in order to have a next meeting uh, with a better weather. And, uh, okay, apart the joke, <laughs> apart the joke about the budget. Huh? <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, it's an honor to host you and to award you with this, uh, uh, with this medal. I think that uh, the contribution uh, is even more important uh, w because it is in the context of the, all the activity on gravitation and gravitational wave detection, which is one of our core activities and where we are willing to invest uh, in the future, creating new infrastructure <laughs> on, uh, on this field. So, um, I was also very pleased uh, when uh, uh, Stefania was uh, recalling all the activity to see how many, uh, 
how many courses, uh, how many workshops has been organized here. I think that uh, is also an, a very important activities, uh, as it was say, to create uh, collaboration and exchange of ideas. And this is even more important in this particular time where we have a war and where we have to try to encourage people to talk to each other. And we should start from science. And I think we should not stop to do this on science. Between different countries, different people, different communities, this will help uh, our uh, society, in my opinion. I, I was also pleased to see how many courses was, were held also during the COVID, because this, is, this was one of the way we decided to follow, not to stop the activity during the COVID pandemic, but uh, to keep alive the community. If, uh, if possible in present, uh, if not uh, in uh, online uh, mode. And uh, I was also finally pleased uh, to recognize uh, that uh, this medal, and also the uh, medal for young uh, uh, theoretical uh, women, uh, uh, are entitled to experimental physicist. <laughs> and as an experimentalist, I'm proud of that. And so, thank you everybody to be here. And uh, let's enjoy this uh, important day. Thank you, Stefania, and thank you to everybody. Grazie, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. But Galileo was not really an experimentalist. Uh, uh, no, we can discuss. Uh, we can discuss. OK, so I also thank uh, Deborah. Yes. She is the pro-rector of uh, research of the University of Florence, and uh, thank you for being here. Thanks, Stefania. It's indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, this morning I was in the Polo Scientifico. I met many of you there for the 50th birthday of the uh, Florence section of the National Institute of, for Nuclear Physics. So today it's a day fully devoted to physics for me. Uh, I'm an experimental physical chemist. Uh, so yeah, nobody's perfect, I know. <laughs> but this was my previous life, I should say, because before I becoming vice president of the university, I think today I, I really realized uh, how much the history of uh, the National Institute of nuclear physics and uh, the Galileo Galilei Institute uh, is uh intertwined, I would say, entangled uh, with the history of the University of Florence and how much this relationship has helped both uh, to grow and uh, it's the, the very essence of science, uh, this collaboration, and it's really, really, the University of Florence valued this so much. And therefore, I'm really pleased to be here and what I was noticing, it's true, this is a gorgeous place, even with the bad weather, I should say, it's, com yeah, I wouldn't do a competition with, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. This is a gorgeous location and so it's so full of history, but still it's so lively with new vibrant science uh, and here. So I like this apparently contrast uh, uh, which is uh, inside this place. Uh, and uh, I should say that uh, uh, this place is beautiful, the organization is excellent, uh, so I would like to congratulate with Stefania, with the committee for the selection, uh, and with the medalists, uh, which I look forward to listening to them, uh, because uh, uh, as I said, I, I think I will have something to learn from that. And uh, so on behalf of the, of the president of the university, uh, Alessandra Petucci, who could not make it uh, this afternoon, I would like to extend the welcome that Stefania and Antonio uh, gave you and uh, really to wish you a, a very pleasant afternoon because the very essence of science is exchange, collaboration, going beyond borders, as Antonio was uh, saying. So with that, I will stop. Um, thank you again. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I will be here all the afternoon and try to understand something, which I'm not sure about. Yeah, OK. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much, but also if the university was want to increase the budget for the weather, <laughs> I'm happy for that. Yeah, huh? Okay, I can try, try, try. <laughs> maybe. Uh, 
actually, we, uh, we were supposed to have uh, um, a speech uh, from Regione Toscana, but uh, COVID uh, <laughs> was <laughs> killing, no, killing. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, Lorenzo Bacci is not for him, it was not possible to be here because of COVID, but he's fine. Anyway, <laughs> we go on uh, with the program and uh, I, and we go to physics, okay? This is our, I call him, uh, I call here Michael Peskin. He is uh, currently professor in the theory group uh, in the SLAC National Accelerator, Accelerator Laboratory. He was elected uh, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2000. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist interested in elementary particles and the fundamental interactions. He got important results for the standard model physics, uh, but also for studies of new interactions and particles beyond the standard model. And he is one of the author of a widely used textbook, I use it, <laughs> on quantum field theory. So uh, Michael, I just want to Thank you for being here, and he, he is um, representing the selection committee, and he will introduce uh, uh, the medalist. Thank you. Oh, let's see. I can advance it through this? Yes. Uh, okay, so, um, well, I'd like to thank Stefania very much for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, it's quite an occasion, and as she said, for it for quite a long time. Also, um, I'd like to thank uh, Stefania and the INFN for the ability to participate in this process. Um, I'm representing the jury. Let's see. Um, is that right? No. Oh. There we go. Okay. I'm representing the jury. I, I'm, unfortunately, I can't imitate Edward Witten. Uh, please excuse me, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, actually, the members of the jury were all old friends. We had a great time uh, with the many really very strong applications and recommendations for this prize. Uh, we had about as much fun as you can have in Zoom meetings uh, trying to make this decision, and I think we're really honoring some people who have a great achievement. And so I'd like to just briefly talk a little about that. So we're talking about uh, Thibaut D'Amour, Alessandro Buonanno, and Pretorius. So I have here just a little biographical sketch of each. Uh, Thibaut D'Amour uh, really has been more or less for his whole career in Paris, a short time at, as a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton, um, uh, basically going up the whole ladder as uh, director of research at the CNRS and for a long time also professor at the IHES in Paris. Uh, Alessandra now belongs to the next cohort of experts on general relativity. Um, she uh, has her PhD actually from Pisa, uh, next door to here in 1996. Um, then a postdoctoral fellowship with Thibaut D'Amour in uh, IHES then a few years to breathe the rarefied air around Kip Thorne at Caltech, and then eventually ending up at the University of Maryland where she's been a professor for a long time. Uh, now she's also a director of the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. And now we go to yet the next cohort of great experts in general relativity, uh, Franz Pretorius. Um, now we're talking about a PhD of 2002, uh, again, a postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech, and the benevolent influence of that group appears once again. Uh, a brief time as a professor at the University of Alberta, but um, in view of some spectacular achievements, which we'll talk about, uh, a professor at Princeton University now for a long time, and the director of the Princeton Gravity Institute. So let's just talk a little about uh, the achievements of these people in some general terms. And then I'll turn it over to them to give you uh, many more details. OK, so we, we're talking about gravitational radiation. Uh, gravitational radiation was introduced by Einstein as a part of general relativity. 
It appears in his papers in 2016. However, there's an asterisk, and we will uh, discuss the asterisk in due course. Um, the first attempts to actually detect gravitational waves from uh, astrophysical sources were made by Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland. Um, here is his device, a very small oscillating bar, which can actually extract energy from gravitational waves in principle. It was really a heroic achievement to start this field, but let's just say this bar of very macroscopic size is just orders of magnitude away from what's really required to make the discovery of gravitational radiation from astrophysical objects. And uh, we now know that what's required instead is a uh, now kilometer size uh, receiver with extremely precise optics to detect extremely small variations of the lengths of the arms here. So this is a study that began in the 1970s. I think, uh, um, I'm not sure who was the first, but I think Reiner Weiss at uh, MIT gets a lot of credit for that. Um, it, however, really requires big science. And so we're also celebrating the US NSF funding of LIGO, which began in 1988, and the CNRS and the INFN funding of the Virgo uh, detector, which began in 1993 to 1994. And even from those dates, uh, now uh, more than 15 years, to the first actually astrophysical detection in 2016. So here are the three sites, the two LIGO sites and the Virgo in Cascina, very close to here. And um, of course, the results of these experiments are extremely well known, I think, inside and outside the scientific and they led to the Nobel Prize in 2016. This is a very nice picture of the laureates to, together with the, astro the astronaut Mae Jemison. Now, this is not what we're talking about today. Be what we're talking about today is the other side of this endeavor. Because I think it's very important to point out that together with this enormous engineering achievement, the enormous achievement in the precision of measurement that's required to see these signals, one also requires an enormous achievement in theory. And that's true for two reasons. First of all, if you see a signal, you want to be able to interpret it in some way. And so you need a theory to tell you how to interpret the signal. But even more important than that, you need a theory to tell you how to detect the signal. Because these gravity wave signals, gravitational wave signals rather, are buried under mountains of noise. And they're extracted by knowing what you're looking for in the sense of understanding the waveform that the detectors will find coming from, for example, inspiraling black holes or inspiraling neutron stars. And so that has to be understood uh, very carefully because those provide templates which allow you to extract the signals from noise. So now one might ask the question, well, why is this hard? You start with two black holes at large distances. They orbit each other. They emit gravitational radiation by the quadrupole, the varying quadrupole of the system. Uh, that's very elementary. You can explain it to an undergraduate. You can have an undergraduate compute the gravitational radiation when these black holes are very far separated. And then you would say you just follow the equations of general relativity in. You do some perturbation theory. How hard can it be? Well, that's a vast understatement of the problem. Because there are two very important subtleties that one has to come to grips with in order to understand how to do these calculations. The first is that black holes are not point particles or particles that are, um, as it were, easily and readily linearly deformable. They're dynamical objects. They, when you have two black holes orbiting one another, they act on each other with tidal forces. They distort each other. The black hole has a singularity in the center. All of this has to be dealt with when you consider the theory of black hole inspire, in spiral. But even more than that, you're dealing with general relativity. And general relativity is an extremely subtle subject. Um, this is the basic equation of general relativity that I wrote down here, the Einstein-Hilbert action. And the property of this action 
is that it's completely geometrical. It only depends on the geometry of space-time and is totally independent of what coordinate system you put on space-time. So that's what physicists consider the beautiful part of general relativity. But it's also the most troubling part. Because basically, in general relativity, the whole time history of the universe is, as it were, painted in some arbitrary way uh, on the space-time manifold. And you have essentially an infinite number of ways of coordinatizing that painting. But it's an art to find the right way to coordinatize the painting in order to be able to do calculations, and especially calculations at the level of precision needed for these experiments. So um, now, general relativity can also host singularities in these coordinate choices. It's possible to have singularities which ha actually have no physical meaning and can be dispelled by a change of coordinates, the most famous of which is the singularity in the Schwarzschild solution for the elementary solution for a black hole. And these need to be under complete control to obtain precise physical predictions. And now we come to the asterisk, because there is actually a paper by Einstein and Rosen, the man himself, in 1936 with the title, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And the answer given in this paper was no, you can gauge them away. That's Einstein. Fortunately, he submitted it to the Physical Review and it, this paper was rejected by the referee. The referee turned out to be uh, Robertson and actually later Einstein met Robertson at Caltech and Robertson convinced him of the errors, error of his ways. But if Einstein could make an error that gravitational radiation doesn't exist, you can think that maybe lesser people might have a little trouble calculating its physical properties. <laughs> okay, now the next slide is extremely important. Um, the, I think that the goal of trying to put coordinates on space-time to do calculations of gravitational radiation is very analogous to something in art because basically in general relativity, you have, as I say, the total freedom to put coordinates. And total freedom is exciting, but it's also a burden because you have to use that freedom in order to achieve some goal, which you don't know where the goal is. All you know is that there are a million roads to get there and only one is the optimal one. So we can talk in art about Picasso who had a lot of freedom. But Picasso didn't have total freedom. Uh, his women had noses. The nose might be in the wrong place, but it was pretty clear what was going on. Um, the real analogy is to the birth of abstract expressionism. And so this is a painting of de Kooning from 1948 when he was trying to basically invent abstract expressionism. And at this time in his life, um, he, he didn't have much money. He had a finite number of canvases. He chose this black and white paint because it was very cheap. And every day he would paint something and then the next day he would scrape off all the paint because somehow it wasn't realizing his ideas and try again. Because the essence of abstract expressionism is that you have this total freedom of abstraction but at the same time you need to communicate. And that's very analogous to what the laureates today have done to try and take the total freedom that general relativity allows you to find the best path toward getting the physical predictions, somehow finding a way through this maze of opportunities and alternatives to really produce physical effects. It's an amazing achievement. Uh, just now let me give a little orientation to what you're going to hear. There are actually two stages of a process where black holes orbit each other, coalesce, and eventually eat each other up in some kind of cosmic catastrophe. The first is the in spiral, when they're far apart and you can consider the gravitational radiation to be admit, emitted by a sort of perturbation theory around the Newtonian theory. And this is described by an analytical theory. Um, the, the optimal method turns out to be the effective one-body theory that was developed by Damura and Buonanno. 
Um, then there's the final stage where the two black holes eat each other, envelop their event horizons, and become a single solitary object as the result of this catastrophe. And for that, you need the full nonlinear numerical simulation. Uh, it's not known how to do this analytically, but the numerical problem has also a tremendous number of opportunities, but at the same time pitfalls. And so that also is something that had to be conquered here. And that really was achieved uh, by Pretorius in a really remarkable piece of work. So um, here's what you want to calculate, the, uh, the waveform. Uh, the thing on the left is the waveform without the final numerical stage. And on the right, it's a slightly different set of parameters. You see the waveform completed by a really very challenging numerical calculation. OK, so let me just say that the calculation of these wave templates, um, of course, in science, there are many, many people who contribute to it. But I think the three laureates today really have a unique place in this history, that the ver all the various stages of it correspond to papers that they've written. I've noted some of the most important ones here. And I'd just like to say that the second paper and the fifth were really just total theoretical discontinuities, where before you didn't know how to do it, and afterward you knew how to proceed, and then you could go on and finish this problem. So this is the achievement we're celebrating today, and that's the last slide. Um, the ability to make precise calculations of the waveforms of gravitational radiation required a new understanding of general relativity, and now reflects this major conceptual advance in our understanding of this subject. And it's a big achievement, and it certainly deserves to be honored. And I'm very glad to be in the position to help honor it with the Galileo Galilei Medal. So uh, let's please thank the laureates, and let's listen to what they have to say. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. And uh, what should we do? Do we want to make a break or we go on? We go on. OK. Let's go on. Let's go on. Who is the first? Uh, you. For the middle, so afterwards. Huh? For the middle. <laughs> 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 Your lecture is the first. Yes, yes. This is, OK. So. Yes. This will be <laughs> OK. It's my pleasure to introduce Thibaut Damou for this uh, medal. Uh, do you prefer to have it? Um, it's OK, I think. Um, thank you. Um, I'm very glad. I mean, the talk of Michael has, has been extraordinarily clear and uh, excellent introduction. Um, I would like, oh yes, this thing is very sensitive. So as we are, as we are celebrating uh, some achievements linked to gravity here, I, I wanted to, to pay uh, tribute to the founder of the field of mathematical uh, gravity, who is definitely Galileo. And, and you know that his, his basic uh, uh, his most important scientific work for linked to the mathematics of gravity was written here while he was a uh, uh, host age <laughs> of uh, the church. And he, he had to ask people from Holland, from Elsevier, to, uh, to come uh, during the night, you know, because he was not allowed to publish anything to give the manuscript so that it be published in, in Holland. And in it, you see that, uh, okay, the acceleration is. Uh, uh, proportional to the square, of, I mean, uh, Z is proportional to the square of the time, there is X and Z, and then it uh, gives a parabola, okay? Now, but the, the modern theory of gravity that we are dealing with is due to Einstein. It was a very strenuous uh, enterprise of Einstein that you can see on pictures taken just after he achieved general relativity. He started in 1907, these are calculations of 1912, uh, it took him uh, eight years to, to go to the Feldgleichung, the 
field equation of generativity uh, that he got in November 1915. Uh, and now what I want to quickly, um, briefly cover is um, a history of the two-body problem in generativity. This is uh, an, an old problem and I, I just want to that everybody measures that uh, uh, science is a cumulative process and uh, as was also summarized by Michael, we, we made some uh, contributions that were very timely but uh, everything is part of a long-term process with uh, many collaborations, many new ideas, okay? And also different motivations because today an important motivation for studying the motion of two bodies, two black holes, two neutron stars, is the fact that we're observing gravitational waves. But for many years, the motivation was different. At the beginning, the idea was celestial mechanics, the mechanics of the solar system. There was a discrepancy with the motion of Mercury, but then immediately people like De Sitter worked out the full equations of motion uh, for the solar system with some errors that were corrected uh, years later. Uh, um, so for instance, one of the first uh, clear derivation was by Einstein Feldman in 1938. And, and, and by the way, one should qualify what uh, Michael said concerning the 1936. Einstein was not saying this was a gauge effect. He was worried that maybe for global uh, problems, there was a singularity globally. So it was uh, not understanding of a gauge subtlety that there was a gauge singularity, but he did not say gravitational waves were, could be gauged away. Okay. Uh, this was, uh, it was a mistake of Einstein, but with uh, under, uh, deep understanding. Now the, the second type of, uh, uh, starting in 1924, there were early investigations of gravitational wave emission and gravitational wave damping with a lot of um, discussions about if a system of two bodies emits gravitational waves so loses, as Einstein computed already in 1916, energy to infinity, you expect that there should be a reaction on the system. If it loses energy in some form, something should happen in the system. But this was a more difficult uh, thing, although Landau Lifshitz argued, argued that this was okay, they were uh, you did not need to lose time with mathematics. Still, uh, important contribution was by Peters in 1964, who did the first computation uh, for binary systems. And one thing I want to insist upon also is because it's something that I, I read as a, um, as a kid. Uh, Einstein in 1916, by the way, said that uh, he derived what is the amount of energy emitted by uh, moving masses and then he put numbers in and then he computed such a small number that he said, and this is a citation, this is a practically vanishing value in all imagining imaginable cases, which means it's so small. Uh, but then he insisted, however, it's conceptually very important at the quantum level because it proves that gravity, this new theory of gravity, as to take care of quantum effects, okay? And he was immediately, you know, in 1916, seeing, okay, uh, we need to take into account uh, if GR quantum effects, okay? Now, uh, in the textbooks, for instance, of Landau Lifshitz, in which it was the first textbook I read on generativity, uh, an excellent textbook, but there was an exercise on gravitational waves. And at the end of the exercise, it was explicitly written it is necessary to know that the numerical value of this gravitational wave energy loss, even for astronomical objects, so binary stars, is so small that its effects on the motion, even over cosmic time intervals, is completely negligible. And uh, so this is in 1966, in this published thing, I mean, one was saying gravitational waves are so small, one should not care about. But there is an asterisk here and the asterisk is Dyson, and I will discuss that on my next slide. Then there was the important discovery uh, in 1974 of the binary pulsar by Hulse and Taylor. Uh, uh, soon after the discovery, people said that maybe we will see gravitational wave reaction effects in this system, but then several theorists rightly said, but the theory is not there. We, it's not really proven what is the exact effect 
of the back reaction of the emission of gravitational waves. This led to the so-called quadrupole controversy and then people contributed uh, to clarify them and to give a full proof in 1982. And then starting in 1993, the perspective of having, you know, detecting LIGO, Virgo gravitational waves became uh, clearly something that will exist in the future. And then the motivation was to study uh, gravitational wave sources. So the problem we are talking about so this is a space-time diagram, so it's not a DNA molecule. It's a, uh, time goes up, space is horizontal. So these two things are the, the two tubes are black holes in space-time going around each other. You know, you have at each moment of time, you have to cut to see what happens if you are not used to space-time diagram. In particle physics also, they are put in the other sense. But here, time is vertical. Then these two things emit gravitational waves. The emission of gravitational waves drains energy and angular momentum from the system, so they get nearer, and they, they go faster and faster until they merge, and then they emit a burst of radiation. So the, the, this is the Einstein equations. For two black holes, we have no matter, so the Einstein equations simplify. This is the explicit form of the Einstein equation, fully in harmonic gauge, okay, just to, so that you see Einstein equations completely. So you have to find a space-time metric, and you have to compute what is the wave emitted at infinity. So it's a well-posed mathematical problem. Uh, now. The history of the motion of two bodies um, went into several uh, stages, like already in 1912, Einstein, when he created, before GR, he understood that he needed a space-time metric and that a test particle moving in this space-time metric will follow a geodesic, the maximum length uh, uh, path in space-time, and therefore described by this. Then there were important contributions by Einstein Grossman, approximation methods. Many people, you see, contributed to the, the motion, the problem of motion, including important contribution by Tullio Levi Civita here uh, in Italy in 1937, just before Einstein and Fell Hoffman. Then new ideas was, okay, how do you, des when you have two bodies, okay, how do you describe the two bodies? And uh, if these bodies are made of matter, you say, okay, I will fill a tube in space-time with matter, but then an important idea introduced by Weil, Einstein, Fell Hoffman was to maybe you can describe the motion just from outside, and that's very important for black holes because black holes do not contain matter, so you need a method that can describe the motion without uh, entering into the bodies. And then mathematically, it was the idea was introduced that you can even go one step further, which and say, okay, formally you say there is a point, although there is no point inside the black hole, and you introduce a so-called Dirac uh, uh, distribution, delta functions to represent them. But then uh, many methods introduced in quantum field theory, like dimensional regularization, IIT continuation, play an important role technically. Okay, I jump by two. No, yes. Uh, later, uh, new methods were invented, um, an expansion uh, where the first step is the, the flat space-time due to uh, uh, Poincaré and Minkowski, and then you go, uh, you perturb space-time, but without assuming that the velocities are small. Uh, other methods based on Arnovit, Deser, Misner, Hamiltonian methods, a method using an effective action, conservative part due to Fokker. Uh, and early on, in the 50s actually, the idea to use quantum S-matrix calculation, that is to say the perturbation theory used in particle physics, was first tried uh, by, um, I guess it was Italian, although he was not working in Italy, Corinal Desi, uh, although this was incorrect, finally, what he was saying. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> sorry, and then uh, others uh, introduce, uh, although these methods actually, uh, Iwasawaki um, did the full 1PN calculation by a, a Feynman integral uh, computation, but he just reproduced things that were known before. I mean, at the time, this method did not contribute new things, okay? Uh, now, I will not uh, enter into the detail, but just to say that today, um, one needs a mix of methods. I mean, one has to combine the best of many different methods introduced by uh, many people. So there would be 
many names who have introduced this method. And, and recently, the idea to use quantum field theory methods has made a very important comeback. I will, at the end, uh, just mention it uh, briefly. Uh, but this is one extra contribution uh, in addition to, so INFN from this point of view uh, uh, is even more relevant from this point of view. Now, uh, I just want also here to say that uh, there is a long history of contribution. So you see many names on, on this chart to get successive approximation uh, for the in spiral, as Michael explained, uh, for the early part of the motion when the two bodies are far apart and they move slowly, you can approximation where the velocities are small compared to the velocity of light, so we give you one first small parameter, and also the, the, um, the gravitational potential is small compared to c squared, so you have two small parameters which are related, and then you can do things at the first approximation beyond Newton, and this was achieved uh, early on, and the second approximation, this was achieved for the first time in 1982, then uh, uh, radiation reaction, then the third approximation, the fourth, and, and, and recently new methods uh, with Italian collaborators have allowed uh, to go even uh, to higher levels, and uh, okay, I will not enter into the details. I just want to uh, show that, um, uh, like you saw in the book of Galileo, that in science, although the ideas are fundamental and you want to get new results, I mean, you have to go, like Galileo said, the world is written in mathematics, okay? In the, Galileo was using geometrical representations of mathematics. Today, we are mostly using uh, algebraic representations, okay? So this is what you have to go through. This is, uh, and, uh, this is that the third approximation beyond Newton description of the conservative uh, dynamics. There was one in between thing, yes. And you need also, so you need two aspects. In some approximations, it's convenient to say that you want to describe the motion and then, um, and then you have to take into account the emission of gravitational radiation. So you also need to work out, uh, starting from Einstein's um, uh, leading role who discovered the so-called quadrupole approximation to the gravitational wave emission, you need to go to higher multiples to higher effects in V over C, and a new formalism had been uh, created for this, and then you can compute things also to a high order. So I thought I had, uh, did I miss a, a slide with Dyson? Did you see the slide with Dyson? Seeing? No, so maybe it, either it comes Oh, I forgot about it. Uh, <laughs> let me go back quickly. Otherwise, I will say it in words. It does not want to go back, this. Because, OK, just to say in words. Uh, yes, I missed it. That's why. OK, Freeman Dyson, who is one of the gods of quantum field theory, was the first one to really understand there was something wrong in the conceptual argument of Einstein, Landau, Lifshitz, that gravitational waves were too small to be important. Because what he said is, okay, it is true that if you solve for a binary system, now it is losing very little energy, but then they will get closer. So in the future, they will lose more energy. And then it goes, you know, a snowball effect. And then he was the first one to say, but after s hundreds of millions of years, the two objects will get extremely close, and in the last orbits, they will emit, as he says, an intense flash of gravitational waves of un unimaginable intensity, as he says. And he added that one should use one of the uh, um, instruments created recently by Joe Weber to look for these events. Okay, so in 1963, Dyson was the first one to put in front of us a challenge, which is, in the first part, you can use the Einstein-type approximations, like Michael said, but in the late, uh, the last orbits and the merger, you need new methods. So it was a challenge created for us by uh, Freeman Dyson from Princeton. Okay, now in, in the 90s, there was um, a different opinion over the two sides of the Atlantic because uh, around Caltech, the group of Cape Thorne insisted rightly with the fact that the, the approximation methods that allowed to compute 
both the, the dynamics and the uh, flux emitted by binary systems from perturbation theories, they were they had a very slowly convergent uh, expression. Therefore, it meant that you cannot use this expression to compute the last orbits, and this was true. These things become useless precisely when you want to use them, which is at the last orbit, okay? Which is a bit uh, a problem, it's a general problem in, uh, p in physics that you want to push to the next approximation, but if the physics is non perturbative, what do you do? And at the time, uh, people at Caltech said that computational techniques, uh, ana I mean, analytic computational techniques will never cover the last 10 orbits and probably there will be something very complicated when two black holes merge, okay. In Europe, we were more bold and we said, no, we can use resummation methods. We can use perturbation theory, then invent several resummation methods to be able to push the approximation up to the last orbit and this was the main motivation of my work with Alessandra where uh, in which we produce the first estimate of the complete waveform, not only to push the in spiral up to the merger, but to declare where is the merger and to complete it by, uh, by the signal uh, from, uh, and this is illustrated here, okay. So the full effective one body method has an Hamiltonian description, which is resum. You have a radiation reaction force, which is resum. Then you put it on the right hand side, you can uh, integrate quasi-analytically the equations of motion, you compute the waveform. So here the two bodies go around each other. Here they will merge. The formalism tells you when they merge and the formalism tells you what to add as a ring down waveform. So this produced uh, in 2000 uh, the first complete uh, approximate uh, waveforms describing the merger of two black holes. And indeed an important um, work was after the breakthrough of France who first got uh, uh, the good gauge and the good many different things to be able to compute the merger of two black holes. The first comparison uh, between um, analytical effective one body and numerical things was done in this paper and the conclusion was that the analytical effective one body was giving uh, a uh, reasonable match and was uh, essentially within 90% uh, uh, was 90% correct. And then later one uh, did other comparisons uh, uh, and then one could bring together, merge the information from numerical relativity and from the EOB to produce a complete waveform. Just to end, I want to say that uh, over the, the last year, uh, the idea of uh, instead of looking at the problem of motion of two bodies going around to do what is the essential thing in quantum field theory which is scattering motions when two bodies you know do not uh, merge and go around but pass at a certain distance and just have their uh, deflection of their trajectories uh, I, actually i pointed out in 2017 that uh, uh, that there, there is a way to connect uh, results from quantum gravitational scattering amplitude and uh, classical uh, gravity. And I was urging amplitude experts to use their novel techniques to uh, get this. And then uh, later there was this paper. And, and, then, uh, and then over the last years, and that's my last slide, there has been a huge effort, especially by the group of uh, Ron Zwiebern, where very conceptually beautiful and important things coming from the quantum aspects of gravity, like double copy, uh, generalized unitarity, but also uh, uh, very special integration methods, uh, new integration methods for uh, very complicated inter econal and, uh, and important work, okay, and uh, very important work in string theory, especially from uh, Matti Ciafaloni Veneziano, which are now uh, connected. And uh, one of the points here is that uh, the effective one body formalism is useful for creating the 100,000 templates that are used by LIGO and Virgo to detect uh, gravitational waves, but it is also a way of translating and gathering information from many different uh, fields of physics and approximation, including string theory and quantum field theory. Okay, thank you for your attention. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. 
the last word was a citation of Henri Poincaré that uh, Henri Poincaré said that there are no definitely solved problems like the two-body problem in general relativity, but just more or less solved problems. Sorry, I messed up the thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there questions? No. Maybe at the end, if you have some curiosity. Okay. Franz, it's your turn. Thank you. I guess we need to switch yes. slides. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no. Well, I guess again, so I'll just say thank you very much for, for this award. It's a fantastic honor um, and a fantastic honor to share it with Alessandro and Thibaut. So thank you very much. I mean, I guess I'm not, I'm not used to this. So if I, if my, <laughs> just remind me. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, the binary uh, the black hole merger problem from a numerical perspective. Um, and now let's see if I can get this right. Okay. Um, so here's an outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll, I'll start with some, some general comments on, on the two-body problem, sort of expanding on what, what Michael said a bit and also what Thibault said. Um, and of course, you know, there's, we could have a whole conference you know, talking about the historical problems and all the people that contributed to the solutions. You know, Thibault listed a lot of the names you know, just in the analytical side. I could do the same on the numerical side. Um, but of course, we, we don't have the time for that. And then it might be a bit boring to those that aren't like sort of doing this day to day. Um, so I thought it just, just um, you know, I'd, I'd pick one sort of the, what I consider the final hurdle. I guess in hindsight, we can sort of identify all the various problems. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of an historical background on sort of the final hurdle and how that was over, overcome. And the last two slides, just very briefly, I'll also just mention some open problems um, in the dynamics of, of black hole systems and binary black hole systems uh, where numerics would be able to, or at least could help uh, give us the answers. Whoops. Okay, so um, let me begin another introduction to general relativity. So. Um, I'll take a slightly different perspective here and say, so general relativity is a theory about the nature of space-time. So it's Einstein's theory about the nature of space-time, positing that space-time has a geometric structure, it's dynamical, and it's governed by the Einstein field equations. So the left-hand side is something called the Einstein tensor. It's uh, you, when you take the, the act, the, you vary the action that Michael showed, you get the Einstein tensor on the left-hand side. Um, that, that characterizes the geometry and that can be sourced by matter on the right-hand side. But of course, what's interesting about relativity, one of the things that's interesting about it is it's a nonlinear theory. And even in the absence of matter, when TAB, the stress energy tensor of matter, is zero, you can have non-trivial solutions. And in fact, that's it. everything that we're talking about today is with TAB equal to zero. So it's really the, the, the structure of vacuum uh, gravity. So I think, you know, if, if you were if you were told that, that you know, some genius like Einstein had come up with a theory of space-time, um, probably the first two questions, or the first questions you ask wouldn't be, well, what's the one-body problem, what's the two-body problem? Like with a theory about the nature of space-time, you might want to ask, well, how can I travel in time? Like, are there perhaps shortcuts in space that, well, what we call today, are there wormholes that, that might exist? Um, but the fact that you know, the, perhaps the two fundamental problems about space-time you know, the one-body problem, you know, you're thinking about it from a sort of the Newtonian problem. It's like, what is the force field produced by an idealized point particle? Um, and then the two-body problem is, how do these particles interact? That's sort of inherited from the fact that general relativity, this theory of space-time, sort of did away with gravity as a force. So if you posit space-time has this dynamical structure, uh, one of the consequences is, is that we experience gravitational phenomena without requiring gravity. And I think it's, it's kind of you know, amusing perhaps to think, you know, that um, so yeah, this little, the, you know, the one of the, of course, one of the many things that Galileo is famous for, but the, perhaps one of the most famous ones is dropping the two objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, and that aspect of gravity from the Newtonian force perspective is actually very unintuitive. And it's actually quite confusing to think of that. You have two objects, you know, one could be very heavy, one could be very light, they could have very different structures. And if there are no other forces acting on them, then of course, what he famously showed is that they fall at the same rate. 
you know that and that is you know it's so unintuitive that it took until Galileo for something that everyone experiences every day to actually start taking as fact. But that that property of gravity is actually very simple from a space-time perspective. So sort of as Thibault showed in his talk, um, that comes from um, the, the the geodesic nature. So you ask, okay, space-time is an interesting structure. How do bodies experience that structure, particles, etc.? Well, they follow these optimal distances through space-time that we call geodesics. And that optimal distance is a property of space-time. It's not a property of the body. So those two balls that Galileo dropped, they're following these curves through space-time despite their structure. So it's kind of interesting that something that's so complicated <laughs> you know, in ordinary gravity, which is actually quite simple compared to relativity, is actually one of the simple things in relativity. Okay, so let's, let, let me try and sort of define that a bit more price, precisely. So actually, you know, the one and two body problems is not a simple concept in relativity. And this also goes to what, what Michael was talking a bit about, about black holes. So let, let's, try to, let's try to answer those questions in general relativity. So let's first start with the one body problem. Um, so what is the, you know, okay, the structure of space-time, or, or, or if you will, the force field that's produced by an idealized point particle? And the problem in general relativity is there really is no sensible notion of a point particle. And so here we can imagine, well, let's try to, let's try to create one in some sort of sequence of events where we take some, some amount of mass here and we compress it into an ever smaller uh, volume and we try to create a point particle. And so you'll find that if it's initially, if it's very distended, um, it will curve space-time a little bit. So say, take, say it's the left one, that might be the sun. You start to compress it. It might become like a white dwarf, which is a, you know, just a few thousand kilometers in size. It's going to curve space time more. If you get it to neutron star densities, you know, say 10, the sun down to something like that's 10 to 20 kilometers, it's going to be quite a significant distortion of space time. You continue that process, but at some point, space time breaks down. So that's if you, if you start to compress it and you, you cross the, the, the radius, the so called Schwarzschild radius. You can't do this this process um, that we imagined of making it ever ever denser because space time undergoes gravitational collapse and a black hole forms. So once that happens, it doesn't even make sense to think that there's a point particle source. Space time has become intrinsically dynamical. Everything is flowing towards a singularity, and in fact, what is what sources that black hole doesn't matter anymore. Um, in fact, you know, as Thibault mentioned, this is a vacuum problem. So here we imagine forming it with matter, but once a black hole forms, it doesn't even really matter what's inside the black hole. So you can have a completely vacuum solu uh, solution that gives you a black hole space-time. So that tells us the answer, in a sense, the answer to the one-body problem in general relativity is a black hole. That's the sort of the fundamental, or the simplest kind of, if you will, point particle structure that you can have. But again, remember, this isn't a point particle. It isn't a, um, you know, it's a simple field like that. You know, a black hole is still a full four-dimensional uh, space-time geometry that actually has, you know, infinitely many degrees of freedom. It doesn't, doesn't just have a mass or a spin, uh, but it could be dynamical. There could be radiation. And it's actually only in the stationary limit. If you take a black hole space-time and just sort of keep it away from everything else and let it settle down, then it will become... Um, at least something which is parametrically very simple. It's still this full space-time structure, but you can describe it with only two parameters, its mass and spin. And that's sort of the celebrated uniqueness or no-hair theorems. But underlying that, there's still this four-dimensional geometry. So now if we go to the two-body problem, I mean, in some sense, all of the complexity of the two-body problem, well, a lot of it is really inherited from the fact that the one-body problem isn't simple. It's a full four-dimensional space-time. And so now really the two-body problem is saying, okay, now we've got this, uh, this four-dimensional dynamical space-time and there are actually two horizons. At some time, there are two horizons present. And then you want to understand, well, how does that space-time evolve? How do those horizons evolve? And again, you know, this, it's not something where they really are just sort of you know, two particle-like degrees of freedom. But thanks to the uniqueness properties of black holes, if you prepare two black holes in relative isolation, say in a pristine environment, so there's no cosmic or large cosmic background of, of radiation, there's not a lot of matter around. If you, if you prepare a black hole, um, two black holes in a pristine environment, then they will very, se very quickly settle down um, to, to these objects that are parametrically simple. 
again because of the no hair properties. So you can describe them by a small uh, number of parameters. And then it kind of makes sense to think of, well, okay, this is sort of the idealized two-body problem that we want to understand. Given those small set of parameters, the masses, the spin vectors of the black hole, some initial separation, how do they evolve? How do they eventually uh, spiral into each other and merge? And actually, you know, that's sort of kind of thankfully that in general relativity there is this unique property that this two-body problem is that simple. And this is actually a practical problem that we can compute these templates through whatever methods. You know, if, if we needed to deal with the infinitely many degrees of freedom of the full theory, it would just be a no-go. We'd, we'd, we'd have to, as theorists would never job, it would be up to the experiments to observe what black holes look like. We wouldn't be able to compute it. Whoops. Okay, so, so, so also one reason why is to try to present the Einstein equations and the one and two pro problems from that perspective is perhaps then you can sort of appreciate why the numerics is, is challenging. Um, so, you know, in some sense then, to, to find the answer, we don't really deal with um, sort of two particles and the forces that, are th that they're exchanging, but we have to solve for this dynamical four-dimensional geometric structure. Um, and in fact, you know, f from that perspective, we actually even, you know, in some sense, we don't even put the black holes in. These are properties of the space-time that you sort of a priori can extract from the simulation. Like, were there two event horizons? Um, and you know, at that point, you know, once you go beyond the difficulty of one black hole, if you have two black holes, three, four, five, you know, n, you know, from a space-time perspective, it's basically all as, as complicated as, um, as the two-body problem. Now, fortunately as well, and this is you know, what Alessandro and Thibault uh, showed also building on the work of, of a lot of other people, is in that in-spiral phase, um, you really can actually, in a very quantitative computational way, deal with this, you know, this four-dimensional space-time using perturbative methods, thinking of these things as particles and calculating the forces between them, as Thibault described, and I think Alessandro is going to probably talk <coughs> about a bit more. Um, the, the problem, though, is that once these two things that you too good approximated, treated as particles when they get very close to each other. You know, their finite size is the fact that they aren't, you know, perfectly simple objects. They actually are complicated dynamical horizons when they get close and you have to deal with how they fuse. Then you just have to solve the full Einstein equations. And the Einstein equations are a set of, essentially 10 partial differential equations of, of the space time. Um, and, you know, you, at least as of now, we don't know any other way of just brute force solving the Einstein equations. And in terms of brute force solving it, we actually don't know of any other methods in this merger regime um, but numerical methods to solve the equations. Okay, so there's also, as I mentioned, that sort of a long and illustrious history, um, you know, sort of you know, attempts to solve the two-body problem. And unfortunately, my, sort of my one slide is, it, I, I'm just going to apologize for all the names that should be here that I just don't have time to go over. I've, I've put in a couple just, just so you can see kind of the, uh, the time frame. Um, so the first numerical attempt to solve the two-body problem was by Hahn and Lindquist in 1964. And in interestingly, that's before the phrase black hole had even been invented. <laughs> so they, 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 they actually called it like the geometrodynamics of two wormholes. So the space-time bridge between things which we now realize are sort of being black holes. Um, and they, they realized the importance in, in computing the, the, you know, the, the beginnings of the two-body problem, how they start accelerating towards each other. Um, the, the first sort of full simulation of a merger that, that was successful was by Larry Smorey in 1975. And that was a head-on collision of two black holes. And at least from the, sort of the differential equations perspective, why that simplifies things is it becomes an axisymmetric problem. And so the, you know, they said if you, if you have to deal with the brute force solution, well, if you could actually simplify it by symmetries, then you can, then that helps a lot. And that's what he did in the 75, in 75. And so probably most of the, the numerical attempts around that region until the early, around that time, until the uh, early 90s, it was m mostly out of sort of theoretical curiosity in some sense with people trying to attempt it. Um, but then you know, with the, 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 the increasing sort of push towards trying to observe the universe in gravitational waves, and eventually in the 90s, I think the big thing, or perhaps starting in the late 80s, as Thibaut said, uh, or sorry, as Michael said, 
um, the NSF finally decided that they were going to fund the LIGO collaborators, and, um, and I guess the funding for Virgo was also probably around in a similar time frame. And then it was realized that if we don't actually compute theoretical templates of these things, it doesn't matter, you know, th they'll be able to know that they, they saw something, there was some event out there, but they wouldn't know what it was. So then it became realized how crucial it was to uh, produce these waveforms. And uh, you know, one of the you know, things that happened at that time was the so-called grand challenge of the 90s. And again, at, at this point, probably the majority of the numerical relativity community started working on this. And you know, there are many people that deserve credit for sort of building the, the bricks that eventually got to the, I guess, the tower where I pushed the final brick over. Um, and yeah, apologized for not being able to mention them. Um, and even you know, at the time that, you know, in, you know, again, in hindsight, there are many things that were necessary. I'm just going to mention one just to give you sort of a, a sense of it. And that's the problem of how do you call, control the so-called uh, constraints, the constraint equations. So, so the, the, the problem with the, the, constraint, the, the constraint equations, um, so did I? Yeah, so I, I did skip one. Okay, so the, the thing, so we have the Einstein equations, which I had in that nice GAB equals eight pi TAB form. And we're just looking at the GAB piece. So it's a, it's a tensor, it's in four dimensions, it's a symmetric tensor, so they're 10 independent components. And what we want to solve that for is the metric tensor that tells us of what the geometric structure of space-time is. So there are 10 components of this metric, um, and they solve you know, this, this set of coupled partial differential equations. Now, what, 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 what Michael mentioned about, okay, we have to sort of, there are infinitely many ways in which we can paint the coordinates of space-time to describe a situation. But actually, it, in some sense, it's even worse than that because there are infinitely many ways in which you can rewrite the Einstein equation, so-called formalisms, um, before you even choose the constraints. Sorry, before you even choose the coordinates. So one class of methods of writing the Einstein equations is you want to write them in a so-called Cauchy uh, formulation. So you want to try to pose the Einstein, or pose the problem in such a way where we specify initial conditions at some time along some time slice, and then ideally we want hyperbolic equations where we can sort of evolve that forwards in time. So th that that's that's not a unique way of doing it. That's one way of writing the Einstein equations. And there's there's actually in principle infinitely many ways of even just presenting the Cauchy problem. But now, when you do that, one, the, one of the difficulties of that is you find that the equations become overdetermined. So I mentioned there are 10 metric quantities that we have to solve for. Um, but it turns out that, okay, so you've got four coordinate functions as painting the coordinates on. So in some sense, you've got six equations left. Um, or in some sense, you've got six evolution equations. And with that, you can come up with a unique solution to a well-posed hyperbolic formulation of the Einstein equations. But the problem is that they're overdetermined. There are an additional four equations in the, sort of in the simplest formulation, the so-called constraints, that you don't solve. And so sort of you, usually, you know, if, if you think, say, you know, even a linear algebra system, if you've got more equations than unknowns, you're not going to get solutions. But luckily, with the Einstein equations, um, that sort of it's it's a it's it's a consequence of the the, the vanishing divergence or the so-called contracted Bianchi identities, which inter, which is intimately related to this property that objects follow geodesics as well through space-time. Um, it turns out that this really isn't a problem from a theoretical perspective, um, and the reason is if if you specify initial data and you solve the constraints at the initial time, so you make sure that they're satisfied then the evolution equations, the subsystem, will propagate those constraints forward in time. And I say here that they kind of morally, you can think of the constraints as being elliptic equations, but that's also to some extent a function of the formulation, is that there is freedom in how you choose them. So you can sort of think of them as being a set of four elliptic equations that you solve at the initial time, and then you evolve the, the, the solution forward using the rest of the Einstein equations. Okay, so you know, so that, that that's not a problem. It's 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 overdetermined, but there you do get unique solutions. It's not that there aren't solutions. Um, now numerically, uh, you might think, okay, well, one problem is even if you solve the constraints exactly at t equals zero, now you start a numerical evolution. So you've discretized the equations in some way. That discretization introduces a certain amount of truncation error. Um, so there's going to be a small little, little bit of truncation error that's present. 
And that will not satisfy the constraints generically. But you can say, okay, well, that's also not a problem because the numerical solution, the evolution equations aren't exact. They also have this truncation error that depends on the resolution. So it's only exacting the limit where you go to infinite resolution, which will require infinite computational resources. So there's always a little bit of numerical error that we have to deal with. And again, that's in principle not a problem. But the difficulty, it turned out to be, is that uh, uh, the constraints, they just grew too rapidly with time. So, 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 so this is like kind of a sort of a schematic sort of to illustrate the problem. So now imagine that this sort of white space here is, let's think of it as solution space. So all possible space-time geometries that are solutions to the evolution equations just by themselves. So for example, we pick our t equals zero, our initial conditions, so our initial space-time, say representing two black holes. Um, and now we evolve them with some evolution system. We have some trajectory through this solution space. The Einstein equations tell us, well, it's only one trajectory which is allowed, one trajectory which satisfies the constraint. So it's as if we say, okay, we can pick a direction here, which is the correct direction, and that is the true solution. Now we say, well, let's do that numerically. So we exactly the same initial conditions. What I'm calling it as a good solution is if the, if the trajectory there always stays close to the continuum solution to within a controlled um, amount of trun tr truncation error. The problem here is with the bad numerical solutions. And, and I should emphasize that these aren't sort of bad formulations. They're not bad codes. Um, it's, these are still perfectly convergent, self-consistent solutions. The problem only is that even though you start with an exact solution, the little bit of if you will, noise, it's not really noise, not, not in an experimental sense, but of the truncation error that's present causes it to grow on an exponential trajectory away from the correct solution. Um, and actually, you could just, from this picture intuitively, you can see why in t exponential deviation is actually not, is kind of natural. Because, th th you know, so you just imagine you had some, does this have a laser pointer? No, so, I just, whoops. Yeah, the laser pointer. Oh, at the top. Oh, at the top. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so imagine you, you're on, a, on a, one of these bad solution points and you ask, okay, how much is it going to grow in the next time step of your evolution scheme? Well, it's not unnatural to think that it will grow by an amount that's proportional to how far you're away from the, the, cor the correct solution. And that's, just, that's the definition of exponential growth. So it turns out that it's kind of easy to get exponential growth. And in fact, that was, that was kind of the state of the, the field um, before 2005, and in fact, you know, early on when people, you know, started the, the around the time of the Grand Challenge in the 90s, you know, the, the, the idea was to try to get a, sort of a Cauchy evolution scheme. Um, so sort of this little cottage industry sprouted up of people coming up with new formulations of the Einstein equations, um, and probably by the time when I entered in grad school and then eventually the, the postdoc. There were at least dozens, probably close to 100 formu different formulations, all mathematically sensible, but all, any of them that people tried, they had that exponential blow-up problem. And so they were impractical for, for actual um, computations, because you know, once, it, once it deviates too far, the code crashes and you can't do anything. So, so I chose the harmonic formulation, and Thibaut nicely had the full equation in the one slide. I'm sure you all remember, the <laughs> remember it in detail. <laughs> um, but uh, so, that, yeah, I'll just sort of give a little bit of a historical, sort of just some comments about like, the why, why did I choose the harmonic uh, formulation? I'm actually glad that, that, that uh, Michael gave that the, uh, sort of the artistic <laughs> introduction, because from my perspective, I chose it for aesthetic reasons. And of course, not, not artistically, but it, there is, even at the end of the day, we, we're solving mathematical equations. In principle, we have no choice. We have to solve the equations. But thanks to this freedom that relativity has, there, there are too many ways to figure out what the optimal one is. You kind of have to guess. You have to kind of use you know, your aesthetics. And I chose the harmonic um, coordinates for, for basically three reasons. One is simplicity, um, and that is that if you if you think of the the or you know well okay I won't go into like all of the ways in which people came up with different formulations that introduce new variables and the system of equations would 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 just grow there'd be dozens some of them even had hundreds of 
variables and equations. And so I say, well, what is the simplest way you could write the Einstein equations? Well, the simplest way, it can only depend on the thing that you want the answer for in the end is the metric. And the harmonic formulation is one that, it's a, it's a hyperbolic formulation, it only uses the metric. And therefore, th so at the time it was realized that this constraint thing was an issue. And you know, perhaps you know, going back, so you can see like, you know, if this problem with, you know, this, if exponential growth is easy, if you make a more and more complicated system, you're defining new variables, but you're not adding new more f fundamental degrees of freedom. The Einstein equations just have the fundamental physical degrees of freedom that they have. So adding extra terms, you're adding more constraints. So you're adding more avenues for exponential growth. So I thought having the, the thing which would be the simplest, um, there'd be the best chance of controlling the, the growth of constraints. And then of course another, whoops, sorry. Uh, another reason when you're sort of entering a field and you, you know, is it, uh, you want to do something which no one has done before, of course, right? And actually kind of shockingly, no one had tried harmonic evolution um, before. And that's even more shocking if you think about, you know, the, the, the history that the harmonic formulation has had. You know, it goes back you know, even before this, but this, I mentioned this work by Yvonne Chouquet uh, because it very much relates to all the problems that we had in numerically. And this was back in 1962. Sorry, 52. Did I, uh, sorry. Thank you. So it's even more shocking than it goes back to 1952. <laughs> And, and she, she used the harmonic coordinates to prove the first local uniqueness and existence proofs for the full Einstein equation using harmonic coordinates. And I'd say, you know, the, the reason why it wasn't tried by the numerical community was largely, I would say, largely misguided belief, but I guess misguided in hindsight, but a largely misguided belief that, uh, that they would be prone to forming coordinate singularities. And as, as you know, Michael mentioned, you know, if, if you start painting your space time with a coordinate system and I don't know, you run out of paint, or, right? <laughs> or, or the paint the bucket falls through the canvas and destroys it, then, then you're out of luck. Um, but again, what was again, astonishing about it is that there was this idea that this would be prone to coordinate singularities, but no one even tried to see if that actually was the case. It wasn't because of a computation, it was because of some of, of arguments. Oh, I should say, this is the definition of harmonic coordinates. So this is how you get the harmonic formulation. So you basically just say that each space-time coordinate here, so the xa would be, say, tx, y, and z, it just satisfies a D'Alembertian uh, wave, a covariant wave equation. And perhaps I, to, I can perhaps say, like, the, the level of the arguments for why this would be a problem, well, if the time coordinate satisfies a wave equation, well, we know waves are wavy. <laughs> And they're going to be peaks, and it might be that if at one point the time peaks too much, the slice will become null, and it, and the, the slice will break down. It's okay. I'm, I'm perhaps being unfair to some of the people that made these arguments, but it was basically at that level that because of this wave-like nature of coordinates, they'd be prone to um, singularities. Yes. Yes, that's why right. this is a very illustrious history. He, had, he, he didn't you call them harmonic. I think he called them isothermal coordinates. Or okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, but on the on the other hand, I didn't just sort of sort of pick something um, to defy conventional wisdom, because a few years before, um, there was this paper by David Garfinkel. Um, where, so he was actually trying to simulate the approach to a Big Bang singularity. Um, and that is a very dynamical space-time. But he noticed that the harmonic time coordinate was actually a good time coordinate in the homogeneous isotropic case, sort of approaching a singularity, because it would slow down as you, you'd never actually run into the singularity. Uh, but he was also, he knew that he wanted to go beyond homogeneous and isotropic, so there would be a lot of dynamics. And so he was also worried about this problem. And then it turned out that in, in his paper, he actually didn't need this fix that he had proposed in theory. But he noted that th the way you can fix this, if there are problems with these, you know, these waves becoming ill-behaved, we'll just add a set of source, fu source functions to the right-hand side. Um, now, the, the difficulties, well, like what are those source functions in, in, like for a particular situation? So he didn't actually propose what they should be. But the thing is that this, this shows that in principle there's always going to be a solution. Because you say, well, 
well, any, any space-time in any coordinate system can be written in this generalized harmonic form. It says, well, take that solution, plug it into the left-hand side, it tells you exactly what the right-hand side has to be. Um, the difficulty now is if you're in a Cauchy evolution, you don't know what the answer is going to be. You have to kind of uncover these source functions as you go along. But in any case, sort of for me, the, the, the thing that was inspirational about this is that an in-principle solution was available. So I knew I wasn't just doing something completely uh, foolish by choosing harmonic coordinates. And it actually it turned out at the, in the end that you, know, you didn't really need much of a source function. And even for like an equal mass in spiral, um, you could probably get away with pure harmonic. It's just, just the very last stages, it helps to have a bit of a source function, but harmonic by itself is actually, is actually quite good. So this, so when I first started looking at it, I realized that the coordinates wouldn't be a problem, but then the constraint problem was also present in harmonic. And that brings me to this, this final sort of ingredient that was sort of added to the code that made it work. And this is the so-called idea of constraint damping. And actually before that, there, many people had this idea. So the, 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 the ideas were, um, so how do we deal with the, the constraints being ill-behaved? Uh, well, we can modify the Einstein equations by adding various multiples of the constraints, or various homogeneous functions of the constraints. Because if the constraints are zero, we're adding zero to the equations. So we don't change solutions to the Einstein equations, but if we, are, if we deviate from them, then those things would have an effect. And then the idea would be you, you try to control how you've added those extra terms to perhaps try and tame the exponential behavior. So again, this, this, these ideas floated around, but the particular version that I used it was, actually I was at Caltech you know, at, the, at the time and Karsten Gundlach visited, and he'd worked out the scheme for one of these many formalisms that I mentioned, the so-called Z-formalism. But what he pointed out is that the Z-formalism uh, is actually similar in many respects to harmonic, and he suggested what he had proposed for Z4 should work with harmonic, and I tried that, and. It was, it's, it's literally about as simple as this, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but it's essentially it's saying, so now with the harmonic coordinates, you just take the source functions to this side. This has to be zero, so this is your, const the, your, your constraints. So this should be zero for any solution to the Einstein equations. So you can add any multiple of this. And I guess to get a good ex tensor expression, you know, this has to be a tensor. But also, it's important that this is a time-like vector. And essentially what, he was a, what they were able to show for the Z4 formalism is you pick a, f a direction of time given by this n vector, you add some constant times this particular object, and by choosing the right sign for the constant, um, you can have the constraints damped in the direction of the, the time vector. And yes, yeah, so a pretty simple change, and you know, it, it worked. <laughs> and just, just to, to, to oh, so I guess it starts immediately, but let me, let me, let, me, let me just explain this now, uh, uh, play it again. So, the, the, so okay, let me say, so you know, I spent probably a few years, um, all of my postdoc, you know, working on the codes, developing stuff, but adding this was just a couple of days, literally. And then I saw what I'll show you here, how well it worked, and that, that's when I got, started getting excited. <laughs> um, sorry. Okay, wanna, okay. So what, what, I, what I'm showing you here is, well, the first thing I tried it on then was a plain old simple Schwarzschild solution, non-rotating black hole, there are no dynamics. So the dynamics that you're gonna see is pure truncation error. And this is an equatorial slice through Schwarzschild, two, two different simulations, one with constraint damping on the right-hand side, the left with nothing, the harmonic evolution. And what the, the square-like structure you're seeing is because I'm using a Cartesian coordinate system, there's adaptive mesh refinement, so the resolution's increasing here. That's the little black hole there in the center. And so now let me, let me play it again. And th this is the norm of the constraints. And so, whoop. and now it's not playing, let's see. Okay, there it goes. And so you can see on the left-hand side, very quickly these things blow, grow, and it went black because they grew so large, the computers generated what are called not a numbers, NANs, and it crashed. On the right-hand side, pretty much nothing happened. There's nothing gravitational about this. This is just the, uh, the constraints. But that, that's fine. I can find another seat afterwards. <laughs> okay, um, but I'll just, just quickly play it again. 
So you can see the left hand side, all the dynamics you see, that's the constraints blowing. On the right hand side, pretty much no nothing is happening. And so then I knew, okay, that's, you know, then I started working hard on trying to get the first binary evolution. And let me just show you also one very early result. Because one, one thing that was also um, uh, sort of what, what, what I wasn't 100% sure about is before people had proposed things that worked in symmetry reduced space time. So people were able to get Schwarzschild stable, but then when they, when they broke symmetries, they went to the, the full 3D problem what they had proposed stopped working. So again, just because it worked with Schwarzschild didn't mean it was going to work away from symmetries. So then, of course, I had to do, I had to break all the symmetries. And this is the first example of a grazing collision that, that did work. Um, but also, <laughs> just to show you how kind of unprepared I was for the, for the success of the, um, that harmonic adjustment is I actually didn't have initial data with black holes in them, two black holes. So what I did is I actually used scalar fields, very dense concentrations of scalar fields that under their own weight essentially collapsed to full black holes and that would be the binaries. So here on the left hand side, that's the two pulses of scalar field. It's going through the orbital plane. They collapse, they form the black holes and then those black holes merge. So I'll, I'll play this one. So there, I don't know if you could see very little bit in the center. There were two little black holes. That's, they came from scalar field collapse, they merged. On the right hand side is something called the lapse function. So it's zooming in and that's kind of giving you a more a, a view of the black hole dynamics. So it's really the a grazing collision of two black holes. Uh, one thing that that I discovered to my surprise is that, let me try this again. Um, so those are the, the, two, the two scalar, the sc oh, there we go. Okay, well that one started. So these are the two black holes that are going. And they're the two scalar fields. And notice in relativity, spherical wave, uh, wave fronts become square as they propagate outwards. No, no they don't. That's just, that's just a coordinate effect. So this is actually spatial infinity, but I compactified it in the different Cartesian coordinate directions. So, so that's a complete coordinate artifact. But okay, so then, you know, then you know, then I went on to, to, event, to try, try and get a full orbit. So I'm not going to show anything that's happened since then, and perhaps Alessandra might show movies, but I'm sure you've all seen movies of the many in spirals that, you know, that LIGO produced around the announcements. Um, <coughs> so I'm just going to end in the last two slides, if I have time. I know I've probably gone a little bit, a little bit late, but let me just, just mention a couple of outstanding uh, pro problems uh, in the dynamics of the one body and the two body problem in relativity. Actually, these are probably not of astrophysical significance. I think it's very much under control for astrophysical binaries, you know, thanks to the continued effort by, by many people. Um, the, the issues of do we have enough accuracy, especially for next generation detectors, but the people are working on that. But in terms of kind of qualitative physics, um, I would say the astrophysical merger problem in terms of qualitatively what happens is solved in that sense. But there are still a few unsolved open questions relating to one and two body black hole dynamics. And the first is just with a one body problem. So just a single black hole. And that's what happens when you have near extremal curved black holes. So the curved black hole is a rotating black hole in relativity. Um, and general relativity says that there's a maximum amount of spin a black hole can have. If you go above that, there ceases to be a horizon. It becomes a naked singularity. So those probably aren't of astrophysical or significance, but even trying to push a black hole beyond extremality in theory doesn't seem to be easy or possible. But the interesting thing is when you get near extremal black holes, there's some interesting dynamics, and interesting things that happen, and we don't exactly know what happens generically. Well, one, one hint about the things that become interesting is the exact extremal limit is actually unstable. It was shown by Eritakis a few years ago, the so-called Eritakis instability, um, that there is some form of, of sort of singularity that develops, um, which is perhaps not surprising because it's on the verge of being a naked singularity. But the thing that's perhaps interesting about that, at least in some sense, part of this Eritakis instability is connected with the fact that the quasi-normal ring-down modes of a black hole, so when, a, when a two black holes merge or a black hole forms, it rings down to the stationary curve state at late times, but these quasi-normal modes, 
Um, for low spins, they damp very, very rapidly. But for high spins, they become uh, slower damped. And actually, in the extremal limit, they almost become like normal modes. And then what, what people, you know, sort of inspired by the ADS-CFT correspondence, people looked at black holes in, in asymptotically anti sitter space and realizing that, you know, the dual state to black holes was sort of a, th a, a hydrodynamic state on the boundary, they thought there might be turbulence in, in black brain or black hole space times. And this is a really interesting, a fascinating movie by Adams, Chesler, and, and Liu. Whoops, again too fast once. So this is a, a four-dimensional black brain in asymptotic the ADS space time. And this is its quasi-normal modes with perturbed with this shearing flow. This is actually is decaying in time, but they factored out the overall decay. And the horizon develops this very complicated, interesting structure. And you know, it's difficult to define what turbulence is, but that looks like turbulence. <laughs> so it seems in, in you know, asympt asymptotically four-dimensional anti sitter space, black hole horizons can be turbulent. So people said, well, is that possible like in our, in our um, asymptotically flat space time? Um, and we don't know yet, so that's one of the open questions. But it was argued that in the zero dam limit, you might actually see turbulent dynamics develop on the horizon of a near extremal black hole. And unfortunately, it, it has to be very near extremal. They, they argued probably at least four decimals, 0.999. So it might not be that there are any black holes in the universe that have that. OK, so my last slide, the last open problem, this is now is with a two-body problem. And that's the ultra-relativistic scattering problem. So that's now taking two black holes or two-point particles and you know, making them boost, you know, colliding them at, at ultra-relativistic velocities. So there's several interesting things that happen just from the geometric perspective. So if you actually take the infinite boost limit, um, the, the black holes, once you take the infinite boost limit, keeping the energy of the space-time fixed, the black holes, then you have to shrink their rest mass, so it becomes a kinetic energy-dominated space-time. The rest mass goes to zero, and all the geometry gets length contracted to these plain uh, fronted shock waves. And each one of them is given by the so-called eichelberg sexel solution. So the, the ultra-relativistic ultra version of the two-body problem is what happens when these two shock waves collide. And we kind of, well, there's a lot that we know about in the head-on collision case. That's kind of like what, what Smar did in the seven, in 75 for the, the rest mass dominated version of this. But we pretty much don't know what happens, um, especially you know, when, they, when, the gray, when, the, when the impact parameter is pretty small in the ultra-relativistic case. Let me, just, let me just tell you what happens for at least an approximation to this shock wave collision um, where they're actually, so there you don't see it. So this is something called the Newman-Penrose scalar, which represent gravitational waves. There's actually null <coughs> particles here. So I'm not using black holes. I'm using null particles to source these plays fronted waves. You don't see them here. But this is sort of, sort of trying to approach this infinite boost limit um, in a controlled way with, with particles. And this is just a head-on collision case. So they collide. They very quickly form a black hole. And I can see these sort of this fascinating patterns as the gravitational waves just sort of infinitely spiral around the black holes and decays away. So that, that is just a pretty picture, but it, it just also demonstrates that there's fascinating dynamics that's happening. We don't know what happens in the off-axis case. Um, and just, just a final comment where, you know what, just going, well, let's, let's go wild with the speculations here. Um, but what, one thing that's interesting about this, this infinite boost limit is that in that limit, they stop being horizons. OK, it, it's technically a naked singularity, but if, it, if in, in some sense, there aren't black holes anymore, then, um, well, with the head-on collision case where I showed you a black hole does form, if you have a very large uh, impact parameter, they'll presumably be deflected by some angle and black holes won't form. But that means at a critical impact parameter, you'll be at a threshold of black hole formation. And so another fascinating topic in relativity is the so-called critical phenomenon in gravitational collapse discovered by Matt Choptewick in the early 90s. And that says that at the threshold of black hole um, formation, there's presumably universal behavior that emerges from the field equations. And space-time has a, there's some hypothetical interesting universal solution that emerges. So the two-body problem in the ultra-relativistic limit at a critical <coughs> impact parameter might actually be related to critical phenomena. And just saying, you know, getting back to the 
the previous problem that I mentioned about turbulence on extremal black holes. Unfortunately, it turns out with astrophysical mergers, even if you start with near extremal black holes, when they merge, you don't form a near extremal black hole. It's actually pretty far from extremality. So astrophysically, we might not be doing it. But back of the envelope, is there any way to form a near extremal black hole through collisions? And again, it, it might be at this critical threshold. So there might be extremal black holes formed. It might be a critical threshold. I don't know. I think it's, it's a fascinating open problem, even if it's perhaps not out there in the universe. But uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, there's an urgent question now. Urgent question now? No. No, so we go for Alessandra. <coughs> it's cold. Okay, so first, I'm very happy to be here, and I feel very honored for this uh, award and also for sharing it with uh, Franz and uh, Thibault. So I assume that everybody here in the room has seen uh, the plot here on the left, uh, the first uh, uh, binary black hole merger discovered by the LIGO and Virgo collaboration. And uh, since uh, 2015, uh, 90, almost 90 uh, gravitational waves have been uh, observed by the LIGO and Vigo collaboration. Uh, they are represented here in this plot. Uh, this is uh, the mass of the uh, black holes in solar masses. You can appreciate the spread in mass uh, from something like 5 uh, to 90 solar masses. And contrasted here are the black holes masses that we see in X-ray binaries in our uh, galaxy, and also neutron stars uh, in uh, uh, also in our galaxy at parcel, parcels. And in orange, actually, this plot also shows the neutron stars that have been discovered by LIGO and Virgo. I want also to highlight that, uh, yeah, this is very delicate, actually. <laughs> uh, have to be careful. Um, other these uh, searches uh, of gravitational waves with the LIGO and Virgo data have been also undertaken by other groups uh, outside the collaboration. They have confirmed uh, the events, uh, but also found a few more of them. So a few words about uh, um, what is happening um, with the gravitational wave detectors. The last run, uh, the third run, uh, ended uh, at the end of uh, March 2020. And since then, the interferometers have been under an upgrade. Uh, they will come back online uh, at the end of this year with a fourth run, uh, reaching uh, a range, a distance, to observe a neutron stars almost close to 100 megaparsec. And in this plot here, you see um, the fourth run coming uh, at the end of this uh, year, as I said, uh, bringing also the detector Kagra in Japan um, in, the, in the network. And uh, later, uh, there will be also a fifth run, which will involve very likely a uh, detector in India. So with the fourth run at the end of this year, we expect something like uh, three detec detections per week. Uh, so in a year uh, of the order of 100. And we are still uh, probing a binary system in our local universe, so up to a redshift around one. So what I want to describe in this uh, very brief uh, presentation, oops, oh, sorry. Okay. And this, thank you for this brief presentation. So I wanted to emphasize the importance of the theory in uh, detecting gravitational waves and build the templates that are needed, as Michael was uh, remarking in, his, in the first talk, uh, to interpret the signal. Uh, so I want to describe uh, how we have uh, built this uh, accurate and efficient uh, way for models, uh, in particular the work at the interface between analytical and numerical relativity. And then in the second part, I want to show you uh, how the use of this template has allowed us to extract information in astrophysics, 
in uh, general relativity, uh, in particular focusing on the uh, last run, uh, which has also provided what we call some exceptional events in the sense of binary system with peculiar uh, properties for the black holes and the neutron star. Uh, and also at the end, I want to touch about the future, uh, the uh, uh, next de generation detectors in the next uh, decade that uh, will uh, also uh, need uh, even more accurate templates. Okay, so a few words about the fact that uh, we are interested in the shape of the waveform because they carry information about the source that has emitted them. In this animation here, you see some of the black holes detected by LIGO and Virgo, and here is the uh, binary neutron star as they sweep in band. And um, the signal, uh, the frequency of the gravitational wave is a multiple of the orbital frequency, in particular the dominant mode is the twice the orbital frequency. And the frequency ends, uh, the merger frequency, uh, more or less uh, at this number here, which is inversely proportional to the mass of the binary. So if you take a binary neutron star, because the masses are smaller, the signal lasts for a very long time and it merges in the kilohertz, but for binary black holes, uh, the mass is larger and so they end their life uh, around uh, a few hundred hertz uh, in band. So LIGO and Virgo does study to extract uh, with the templates, uh, the masses, and all the other parameters uh, using Bayesian analysis. But just to understand briefly uh, how the parameters are imprinted on the waveform, the way in which the frequency evolves uh, gives us information about the masses of the system. From the amplitude and the masses, we can uh, reconstruct the distance of the source from the Earth uh, if we know the time of arrival and the amplitude and the phase at the location of the detectors, the LIGO and Virgo detectors, we can reconstruct the location in the sky where the event happened. And if we see modulation in the signal, in the amplitude and in the phase, we can know, we can infer information about uh, the intrinsic rotation of the compact object and also whether the two bodies were moving on a uh, circular orbit or eccentric. And finally, if we can compare the waveform with the deviation from general relativity, we can prove uh, uh, gravity, whether it is general relativity or something else. So as has been emphasized by previous talks, uh, we need to solve the uh, two-body problem in general relativity, uh, so the Einstein equations, very accurately. And as already said, we are using uh, uh, two main methods. One is approximated, uh, analytical, which is the fast way, and the other is the numerical way, in which we solve the Einstein equation on supercomputers. But this is slow, and uh, it can be limited uh, to a certain region of the parameter space. This plot shows the separation between the two objects in the binary and the mass ratio. So a lot of work has been done to put together these uh, two approaches. Uh, so Thibault reviewed uh, in his uh, talk uh, post-Newtonian theory, which is an expansion of the equations in powers of V over C intertwined with GM over RC square because of the viral theorem. Uh, we can do an expansion of the Einstein equation in powers of G. This gives the post minkowskian approximation, which is not restricted uh, to small velocities, so it's particularly suitable for unbound motion or scattering. But we can also expand the, oops, sorry, the Einstein equation in, uh, um, uh, why is it so sensitive? <laughs> sorry. Okay, I have to be very careful. Uh, in the powers of the mass ratio, so if you have a small body that goes around the large body, and uh, this is the so-called uh, gravitational self-force formalism. Uh, then we can put this approach together in uh, the effective one-body approach, which is uh, a semi-analytical approach, which was originally inspired also by ideas in quantum field theory. And this is also completed by numerical relativity simulation. So now I will explain in a few slide more about this approach, which has already uh, been touched by uh, Thibault in his talk. So let me start. Uh, you take uh, a binary system with two masses. 
you can, like in the Kepler uh, problem, uh, introduce the reduced mass and also the symmetric mass ratio, which is dimensionless. And this number, this quantity goes between zero when one body is much larger than the other and one fourth when the two bodies have equal mass. Now, in the case in which one body is much larger than the other, if we want to, for example, look at the binding energy of the system, we know the exact result uh, from the uh, space-time of uh, Schwarzschild, black hole with uh, zero spin, but we can generalize it by mapping the two-body dynamics in the dynamic of an effective body that moves in a space-time, which is not Schwarzschild, it's a deformation of the black hole space-time where the deformation parameter is this mass ratio new. And now in the conservative part of the dynamics, you can in fact build the binding energy using the effective description. And this problem is uh, actually analogous of a similar problem that you can have in quantum electrodynamics, where you can ask the question, can you actually build the, uh, sorry. Can you actually, but it doesn't stop there. Um, okay, sorry. Can you build actually the binding energy of the two bodies that have uh, comparable mass, the charge bodies? Uh, so the work with uh, Timo, Thibault uh, ended up uh, with uh, this uh, mapping between the effective energy and the real energy, which I wrote here. It's a very simple mapping. And after the calculation, actually, we realized that uh, this mapping is, was similar to um, the result that was obtained in the 17 by Brezen, Brezan, Hitchinson, and Zen Justin. They were studying the positronium and they were uh, resumming the Feynman diagrams in the iconal approximation, trying to find a resumed energy uh, given the energy in the one body system. If you put a z equal to one here, uh, and epsilon j to zero, this is basically the Balmer formula with alpha the um, uh, uh, fine structure constant. Um, okay, so actually, for people here in particle physics, uh, uh, this quantity here, if you are studying scattering states, can be related to the Mandelstam variable uh, through this relation here. So this quantity, this quantity here, is basically the most natural symmetric function of the momenta of the two, uh, particles, uh, two particle system that reduces when one mass is smaller than the other to the energy of the body of mass M2 in the rest frame of mass M1. So why one is interested in, in the energy? Because the energy provides us actually the Hamiltonian of the system. And now uh, if you have, uh, you know, a, uh, so if you start from the post-Newtonian Hamiltonian, you have uh, a resumed, um, so first of all, you have the effective Hamiltonian, which is a deformation of the Schwarzschild Hamiltonian. And then you resum it in this, uh, this way. And uh, uh, the potential in Schwarzschild uh, become now dependent on uh, new, the symmetric mass ratio that I introduced before. So in Schwarzschild, you will have only this term, but now you have correction at 2pn order, 3pn, and then 4pn that were later uh, obtained in these papers. So why we care about the Hamiltonian? Because the Hamiltonian, as you will see in a moment, enter in the, the Hamilton equation and allows to determine the dynamics. Higher order corrections can then be added and calibrated to numerical relativity, as I will uh, explain in a moment. Now, having, as I said, the Hamiltonian, you can uh, uh, basically write the Hamilton equation with a radiation reaction force and then uh, solve this equation and obtain the orbital motion. And the or on the orbital motion, you can also compute uh, the gravitational waveform. And this is what we did uh, in the second paper with uh, Thibault. So here you see the waveform during the in spiral. And then at the time, uh, we had also uh, a um, suggestion on how the waveform could be completed uh, also during the merger and ring down with a superposition of quasi-normal modes. This plot actually here shows the evolution of the frequency of the gravitational wave also going through merger and ring down. Okay, 
So now it came in 2005, uh, the breakthrough in numerical relativity with the work of Franz. Uh, this uh, picture, this uh, plot was also shown by Michael. Uh, actually, here you see also in the numerical simulation of the two black holes going around and then merging, the evolution of the frequency of the gravitational waves going through merger and then in the uh, so-called uh, ring down phase. As you can see, the merger is very actually short in time, but it's very energetic because the frequency actually increases very rapidly at the very end. And uh, then it turns out that I met uh, Franz uh, in 2006 uh, uh, in a conference uh, outside actually the University of Maryland where they, I had just arrived. Uh, at the NASA Goddard Flight Space Center. And uh, at the time, then we started a collaboration uh, with also Greg Cook, uh, where we tried to understand uh, what the numerical simulation were saying. And it, here is a comparison with an effective one body waveform with no information from numerical relativity. This was also shown by, by Thibault. Uh, you know, there are some differences, but this is a semi analytical. Uh, uh, you know, uh, prediction, and the other one is full numerical relativity, so this is understandable, I think. Uh, anyway, since then, then uh, various groups have started to um, compare to numerical relativity and also reduce the, these differences. And at the time, um, we developed, uh, uh, at the time I was at Maryland, uh, a first calibrated the UBNR waveform model that uh, now I show very good agreement with numerical relativity, as you can see from this plot. And actually, this waveform model was used in the very first search for binary black holes, non-spinning binary black holes, by the so-called initial LIGO and initial Virgo uh, that happened before 2015. Uh, there were data taken in these two periods and analyzed uh, with these waveform models, but uh, no events were found at the time. The sensitivity was not uh, good enough, uh, actually, to find uh, events. Okay, a few words about extending this model even further and uh, adding uh, spin effects. I have just um, one slide here to say that when you then add the spins, uh, there are several choices that you can make where you put the spin of the, uh, of the two black holes here in the little, you know, effective body uh, all, uh, all in, the, in the spin of the black hole. So you can have a test mass uh, Hamiltonian or a test spin. Uh, also, over time, there were improvement of the radiation reaction force, improvement of the ring down model. In the context of the effective one body, there are basically two flavors of this uh, model that uh, over time have been developed, one um, called SUBNR and uh, that I, uh, I developed with my group at Maryland and then at the Max Planck Institute, and TOB RISAMS with Thibault, Alessandro Nagar, Sebastiano Bernuzzi, and other people, postdoc and students, also actually uh, in, uh, for SUBNR. Okay, so now this is all uh, semi-analytical. Uh, but how do we use the information from numerical relativity? Uh, so from numerical relativity, I uh, want to show just the main points. So in this uh, uh, figure here, in the upper panel, you have the two waveform uh, EOB and NR, when in EOB you don't use any information from numerical relativity. At the beginning, very large separation, they are very close to each other, but then uh, they accumulate some defacing going toward merger. So what we do is that we calibrate the model, we add post-Newtonian corrections, that then we tune to numerical relativity to decrease uh, uh, the disagreement, as you can see in this panel, and then we add also corrections, uh, especially during the plunge, uh, to go beyond uh, the quasi-circular uh, assumptions that are generally used in the model. And so, so that you, one can get a very good agreement at the end. Now, this process is repeated for different numerical relativity simulations that are produced. So this panel here shows uh, in the parameter space of the binary, this is just a combination of the spin of the two black holes and the symmetric mass ratio. In different points of the parameter space, we have numerical relativity simulation in green and blue and also in orange here. And then we tune the model in all these points of the parameter space and then we extend the model everywhere else and we use some numerical relativity waveform to validate the model, which are these uh, uh, red triangles here. 
So at the end of this process, sorry, uh, we obtain a template bank, uh, which uh, I show here um, for um, uh, projected in the mass plane of the binary. So this was, for example, used uh, in the second and third run by the LIGO and Virgo collaboration. So for masses above, uh, let's say, two solar masses, for binary black holes, neutral star black holes of the order of 300,000 templates are used. And at lower masses, uh, post-Newtonian templates without uh, um, plain post-Newtonian templates can be used for the template bank because uh, for them, as I was showing before, we use actually the signal due in the in spiral, we don't need to complete it uh, with uh, uh, the merger uh, and ring down. So now, uh, before I show you some results, uh, application of this waveform, I also want to mention that uh, uh, there are also other two uh, waveform families that have been developed over time. I don't have the time here to explain. Uh, one is built directly in the frequency domain. It's called the Inspira Merger in Down Phenomenological Waveform. Uh, these are also very imp important because they are very uh, fast to evaluate because built in close form in frequency domain, and more recently, uh, so-called numerical relativity surrogate models has, have also been developed, which interpolates directly the numerical relativity simulations. So they are very accurate where they are built, but they are limited because the numerical relativity simulations are only available in some part of the parameter space, and they are also not very long because it takes a long time to actually produce very long numerical relativity simulations. Okay, so now let me start uh, showing you some of the applications for the uh, observation of LIGO and Virgo. So the first one uh, is uh, the, the event discovered the uh, 14 of August 2019 has been called a binary with a puzzling companion. Why? Because uh, the mass of the primary is certainly a black hole because has a mass around 23 solar masses, but the companion, the smaller one, um, it's, we don't know if it is a neutron star or a black hole because the mass is between the two. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, very large mass ratio in this binary, uh, this system is also quite interesting because the gravitational radiation is much more richer. Uh, this is uh, a, a visualization of uh, uh, the, uh, the waveform that corresponds to this event. And uh, harmonics beyond the dominant one, which is the quadrupolar, could be actually seen. For example, the octopolar, uh, starting from nine seconds before merger, can be seen here. Four seconds before merger, uh, the L equal to four, M equal to four, can become visible, and one can go, should go, uh, we, has to go very close to merger, one second before merger, to start seeing uh, the L equal 5, M equal 5. Now, I want to emphasize that, for example, for this event, it was very important to have uh, physical effects like higher harmonics and also precession of the spin in the templates because uh, as shown in this plot, which shows uh, the posterior distribution uh, of the mass of the secondary, uh, if precession and higher harmonics were included in the templates uh, for both these two families of template models, you can see that the posterior distribution are tighter uh, with respect to the case in which these physical effects are not included. And for this event, uh, it was very important uh, to nail down the mass of the secondary because, as I said, it's uh, very peculiar. We don't know if it is a neutron star or a black hole. And the neutron star is supposed to have a mass not larger than 2.1 or 2.2 solar masses. So in this case, it was uh, around 2.6, as I was uh, saying. Now, another example ops I wanted to make is no, I think I have to go, sorry. I think with the video, this is a problem, this uh, going, uh, it doesn't allow. Yeah, but uh, there is the video that I cannot show. No, no, it's okay. Well, the, the video is very short. 
Uh, this event uh, is actually a numerical relativity simulation that you can see here that uh, we produced. Uh, 190521 is actually uh, the largest binary black hole observed by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, the primary mass was uh, around 90 solar masses, and in fact, is posing some challenges to, theor to uh, theorists uh, because uh, these masses should not form from uh, the collapse of star. Um, so what I wanted to emphasize here is that, again, using templates, uh, we can extract the information uh, on the properties uh, of the black holes, uh, the masses and the spins. Uh, and this two plot shows uh, that. So here you see the two-dimensional posterior distribution for the masses of the binary. And here the projection of the spin perpendicular to the orbital plane and on the orbital plane for three different waveform models. We use more than one waveform models because we want to gauge the systematics. Because these waveforms are used, as I said, interpolating numerical relativity waveform and then extrapolating outside uh, the parameter space. And even if you see some differences between them, we are not dominated uh, right now by systematics, but we are dominated by the statistical error that is set by the signal-to-noise ratio in these uh, measurements. OK, so now I want to put together some of the events uh, that were actually discovered during the latest run by the LIGO and Vigo collaboration, which is the third run. And uh, the events put together here, this is the mass ratio Q of the binary, and this is actually the total mass of the binary. And here you see the different events uh, in gray, but some of them are highlighted. So let me uh, point out a uh, few of them. So for example, this event here discovered the 20th of February 2020. Uh, it's another very high mass uh, binary system, uh, close to the mass of the event I was just showing you in the previous slides. And it's also the farthest away at uh, 6 gigaparsec. So this is the one I was just showing you in a few slides ago, okay, the one with the puzzling companion. Uh, this event here is also quite peculiar because the mass ratio is around 30, which is really quite large. And finally, uh, the last one I wanted to emphasize, we, I will come back to this in a few slides, is the first robust uh, neutral star black hole discovered by LIGO and Virgo. Now, one can try also to put together, so now that we have uh, of the order of 90 events, uh, what this event tell us about the distribution of black holes uh, that we are observing. And uh, this is a plot uh, that shows uh, the primary mass spectrum, uh, as you can see, this is the mass of the largest uh, black hole in the binary. Uh, the different curves correspond to different models, not important here to specify, but what is important is that uh, the distribution in mass um, cannot be just uh, represented as a power law, because as you can see, it has some features here and also has not uh, an abrupt uh, cutoff for masses uh, above uh, 60 solar masses, that uh, would be predicted by these uh, models, that, uh, the theory that would say that one should not have uh, black holes formed by the collapse of stars uh, with uh, you know, masses above uh, 60 solar masses. So what happens is that uh, we see some features and we see features, for example, at the peak around 35 solar masses, 18 solar masses, and 10 solar masses that at the moment uh, we cannot uh, explain. And with uh, more uh, detection, with a larger number of uh, population of binary black holes, uh, we may shed light of the presence of these peaks. Another important thing that you can do with uh, the analysis of the data is to, for example, look at uh, the merger rate of the binary system uh, as a function of redshift. And you can see from this plot that the merger rate uh, increases with redshift as expected. We expect also to reach a peak uh, around uh, a redshift of two. And this is consistent with evolution tracing the star formation. OK, so now another uh, thing I wanted to describe as, again, the use of the templates uh, of the waveform models to do science with the detection uh, is basically to look at uh, possible deviation of general relativity. Uh, 
So one of these tests um, is looking at uh, uh, deviation in the post-Newtonian parameter in the phase. So the waveform can be decomposed by an amplitude and a phase. And the phase in frequency domain can be written and expanded in uh, uh, powers in V, okay, in post-Newtonian expansion. Now, in red are the coefficient predicted in general relativity. And these are physical coefficient that depends on effect like uh, spin orbit, spin spin couplings, etc. And if you are in an alternative theory of general relativity, you will have corrections uh, uh, that are zero in general relativity. So you can uh, look for this correction in the data. Uh, and uh, what has been found is that uh, the corrections are consistent with zero. So general relativity has passed the test. But then you can put some bounds uh, on these coefficients. And this is what uh, this plot is showing you. So for the different post-Newtonian parameters, we can bound these parameters here uh, with single events that are represented by these uh, lines here, uh, but also putting all the events together. And you find the best bounds in, uh, in the blue uh, using the last run uh, of the LIGO and VIGO collaboration at the level of 10% for some of the post-Newtonian parameters. Uh, but I want to, uh, um, that you actually focus a moment on uh, the uh, post-Newtonian parameter that corresponds to dipole emission. That is not there in general relativity. This would be testing the strong equivalence principle, because there we get the best bound, actually. Uh, you can see a bound below 10 to the minus 3, provided by the first detection of the neutron star black hole uh, with LIGO and Virgo. And even better, the binary neutron star discovered by LIGO and Virgo, 170817, uh, provide us the best bound on the dipole emission uh, that would be there in a scalar tensor theory at the level of almost uh, 10 to the minus 5. So this is one test of generativity that we can do, again, uh, using the waveform models. And the other one that I wanted to touch upon is the test about uh, the remnant. When the two black holes merge, uh, how can we be sure that uh, it's a black hole, or is it something else? In fact, in general relativity, if you have uh, two black holes, astrophysical black hole, the final black hole should be, uh, the final object should be also a black hole. And uh, the black hole should relax uh, by emitting uh, quasi-normal modes uh, in the uh, stage uh, that we call the ring down. And because of the Noer conjecture, the black hole, uh, uh, the quasi-normal mode of, uh, um, of the ring down, the frequency and the decay time, should only depend on the mass and the spin of the black hole. So what we can do is that we can measure this uh, uh, quasi-normal mode, and we can try to uh, disprove this Noer conjecture. Now, the events uh, that, have been, uh, that have been observed by LIGO and Virgo, unfortunately, don't have a lot of uh, uh, signal-to-noise ratio in the, the merger in down, uh, but few of them, uh, they, they have uh, a signal-to-noise ratio around uh, 6, uh, 8, uh, 9. And uh, so for them, one can do this test. And uh, in the same way I was uh, explaining before, what one can do is basically parameterize the quasi-normal mode uh, frequency, adding uh, a deviation parameter that would be there in an alternative theory of general relativity, and then put, uh, look for deviations, look for uh, this parameter being different from zero. So I show you a plot here. Uh, so this is, again, a posterior distribution for the deviation parameters, uh, considering uh, several events detected by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, but actually, the most important two events were uh, 15, 0, 9, 14, the very first one, and uh, the one detected uh, the 29 of January 2020. Uh, but then you can get also bounds, uh, the overall bound, by putting together many events, uh, and the results uh, is actually given here. So at the level of 7%, 20%, we can bound this deviation parameter for the quasi-normal modes. And this is quite interesting because it's already giving us information about the nature of the remnant, uh, for example, ruling out uh, other possibility than black holes, uh, or even uh, tell us information about the compactness of the object uh, and uh, the fact that it has an horizon. 
Okay, so the last few slides I have are about actually uh, the use again of the waveform models to extract information on uh, uh, matter because uh, with LIGO and VIG observation we have also seen a binary neutron star and neutron star black holes. So for neutron stars, we are interested in the internal structure and the composition. So they are characterized by equation of state, uh, the neutron stars. So uh, here is represented basically the equation of state of neutron star, the mass as a function of the radius. And now why we can uh, probe a neutron star and the equation of state? Uh, because the neutron stars, differently from black holes, have a new parameter. They are described not by just masses and the spins, by the tidal deformability parameter, uh, which basically relate uh, the quadruple moment of the neutron star to the external tidal field. And what's the impact of this parameter on the waveform? Uh, well, this is represented by this uh, cartoonish here uh, uh, plot, which shows, in fact, a binary neutron star and a binary black hole with the same masses but in the case of the neutron star, because of the tidal deformability, you can see some differences uh, going toward the merger. Uh, so uh, the tidal deformability parameter um, can be also, um, uh, actually, in first approximation is constant. Uh, but if you take into account the fact that the neutron star has some f mode and can be put in resonance, uh, you can actually work out an expression that uh, make it depending on time, so dynamical tides. Uh, in any case, all this effect can be included uh, in the waveform. So all the work uh, at the interface of analytic and numerical relativity has been extended also to uh, uh, binary neutron stars. So here you can see an example of uh, numerical relativity waveform compared with an FT1 body waveform with tidal effects. And this waveform, again, were used uh, to analyze the two binary neutron stars that have been uh, discovered by LIGO and Virgo. And just as one result I want to show you, um, uh, so this is the plot from the uh, uh, paper of the LIGO and Vigo collaboration uh, constraining the pressure as a function of the density at 90%, 95% credible uh, uh, level, and also extracting actually the radius of the neutron star at the level kilometers. But many papers have been written you know, on this topic, not just by the LIGO and VIGO collaboration in the last uh, few years. So the last example uh, to complete uh, uh, actually the uh, three binary possible binary systems, the mixed one, uh, waveform have also been developed uh, for neutron star black hole binaries. Uh, so this is again an example. Uh, if you have a neutron star and a black hole, the neutron star can be tidal disrupted before being swallowed by the, uh, the black holes. Um, so this waveform has been also uh, de developed. Sorry. Ah. Uh, just one second. Okay. And uh, this is actually the simulation of the first robot detection by LIGO and Virgo of the uh, neutron star black hole uh, system. Uh, now you see a uh, zoom in uh, of the neutron star that go around the black hole. And uh, because of the parameters, uh, the neutron star in this case is uh, swallowed uh, all <laughs> by the black hole and doesn't form really an accretion disk, so we would not have expected uh, actually an electromagnetic uh, uh, counterpart from this event. And again, the waveform were used, uh, in particular focus on the uh, blue here. These are the posterior distribution to reconstruct uh, the masses of the event. And because of the mass, you can see here the mass is quite uh, small between one and two solar masses. Uh, this is uh, certainly a neutron star, and the, sec the primary object had a mass uh, between uh, five uh, and uh, uh, actually eight solar masses, so it should be a black hole. Uh, now, in the future, we expect a different kind of uh, parameters for the black hole, for example, spin, and we could have actually cases in which the neutron star is actually disrupted, as you can see in this beautiful picture uh, by Tim Dietrich, for which we could expect uh, an electromagnetic counterpart. So let me finish here by looking into the future. Uh, we expect in the next uh, decade uh, new facilities on the ground, uh, the Einstein Telescope uh, in Europe and Cosmic Explorer in the US. 
uh, in this plot uh, you see the improvement uh, in the strain noise going from uh, the current uh, detectors uh, to the one of next generation you may appreciate uh, not just uh, the improvement by factor 10 or even more than 10 but moving more at lower frequency which is very important because this will bring in uh, black holes or even larger masses and in fact in this plot I shown the red shift, uh, the reach, uh, as a function of the total mass of the binary. So this is advanced LIGO or advanced Virgo. And uh, here you see the projection for uh, Einstein telescope and Cosmic Explorer. So one could uh, see black holes of hundreds, thousand solar masses up to a red shift 10, which is basically when the first stars form. So we could see the, the so-called uh, pop trees, uh, uh, you know, uh, black holes or intermediate mass black holes. And even more exciting, there will be a mission in space. Um, the launch now is uh, projected for 2037. This is called LISA, and you see the animation of the constellation going around the sun, lagging behind the Earth. And this is also very important because it will open a new frequency band around the milliards and looking for sources that are complementary to what uh, LIGO and Virgo and the Einstein Telescope and Cosmic Explorer will see, in particular gravitational wave from supermassive black holes. Uh, signal will not be ob observed just for a few minutes, but for an entire year. Uh, and we will see white dwarf in our galaxy so-called extreme mass ratio in spirals, a small body going around supermassive black holes. And uh, even more uh, interestingly, uh, we will do multiband astronomy. There will be stellar mass, stellar mass black holes uh, starting to sweep uh, in the LISA band. And after months or even a year, they could be seen in the bandwidth of the Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer. That will be really exciting. So just to wrap up, uh, so, again, to emphasize the use of the waveform models um, that uh, with the LIGO and VIGO observations. So, with the first uh, two runs, uh, um, we have been able to see, to observe, uh, let's say, the tip of the iceberg of the binary population. Um, all the events, uh, the 10, 12 events that were obtained at the time, were not very different from each other. But the uh, third run, which has been more sensitive, has unveiled a much richer picture of the population of the binary uh, system. We have seen also some exceptional sources characterized by larger mass ratios, presence of spins, and even neutral star black holes. There are questions uh, in astrophysics uh, that are still to be explained. The very, the very asymmetric uh, mass system uh, where the secondary mass uh, is between uh, a neutron star and a black hole. Uh, the black holes with very large mass uh, that are populating uh, the high mass gap uh, where we should not expect black holes formed from uh, collapse of stars. Uh, I showed you also a few examples of tests of general relativity that have been done. Um, uh, there is a bright future with, uh, uh, the, next decade, with the next decade, um, with um, you know, more observations, with much larger signal to noise ratios. And of course, this poses uh, many challenges uh, uh, to many of us that are developing more accurate waveform models because with a la higher signal to noise ratio, we need to have also more accurate numerical relativity simulation, more accurate uh, semi analytical models, uh, and also more even physical effects, uh, in particular eccentricity, which until now, you know, the waveform model didn't contain. So I want to. And uh, also thanking uh, my, my group, you see some pictures here, and uh, also to thank the LIGO, uh, Virgo and Kagra for collaboration, because I believe even the word that has been given, uh, you know, would not be there perhaps, uh, if not with the construction and the work of many engineering and experimentalists that have built this detector that allowed actually us also to carry out uh, these uh, uh, interpretations of the signals with the waveform models. Thank you very much. Sure.
curiosity or question or no? No. So ah. No, no, but it is just a curiosity. Uh, you know, I was wondering uh, uh, if one considers uh, the possible, uh, uh, the possible um, uh, source uh, of primordial uh, uh, gravitational waves, uh, for instance, uh, from an inflationary epoch. Uh, could, could you, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, have uh, some uh, computation uh, of the waveform uh, of this kind of primordial uh, um, gravitational waves uh, from the kind of inflation uh, which took place. Uh, so could, could I have uh, some idea, for instance, uh, if it is a single field uh, inflation uh, or a different uh, inflationary epoch? Assuming that uh, someday in the future uh, there can be some uh, experimental uh, access to these uh, primordial uh, gravitational waves. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, we, um, we do expect uh, that for some of the um, um, models of, uh, of inflation, uh, a so called uh, stochastic uh, gravitational wave background. So, in the signal that uh, is predicted is not in terms of uh, you know the kind of waveform we were describing before, because uh, it's going to be a stochastic uh, background. Uh, so, there are techniques to uh, um, measure this background that already are in place. In fact, stochastic background gravitational waves. There have been paper by the LIGO collaboration, LIGO and Vigo collaboration. Uh, that have put upper limits on this background. Today, at the level of 10 to the minus 11 in omega gra uh, gravitational wave, which is the energy, uh, you know, in gravitational waves with respect to the total energy. Um, now, the models from inflation um, would predict that this number is at around 10 to the minus 15 instead of 10 to the minus 11. So we have to go four, five order of magnitude below. Um, so this will come not, if, not with the next generation of detectors like Einstein Telescope or Cosmic Explorer. But I want to also make uh, perhaps two points. So one is that uh, there are uh, more exotic scenario of inflation that would have uh, a different spectrum that could become blue at the frequency of LIGO and Virgo, and so would uh, be larger than 10 to the minus 14 and 15. So if we find the different slope, you know, of the of omega gravitational waves, um, perhaps we will be able to see this uh, background even, you know, earlier. But the binary neutron star and binary black holes are so many that they are creating also a stochastic background. And this background is above the one from inflation at these frequencies. So if people are trying to understand if they can really see the background of inflation, subtracting the astrophysical one, which may dominate. You want to say something, Tim? No. No, no, no. Sure. Uh, so this is also quite important. But in LISA, in the LISA band, which is a different band, uh, there are not this kind of, uh, so there maybe one could see at lower frequencies um, might not be dominated by the astrophysical backgrounds. So there might be a window. Lo spent. Okay. Uh, okay, if you have other curiosity, maybe we can uh, discuss uh, after. And uh, now I think we can go for, for the. So, President, please. 
me too. <laughs> Let me also call the president of the theoretical committee, Fulvio Piccinini. <laughs> Do you want to say something? No, thanks for the brilliant uh, seminars and for the, all the work uh, you did is very exceptional. The, really, congratulations <laughs> from okay. all the dealists. Okay, so I don't know. From whom should I start? I don't know. Also it's personalized. Are, are at the <laughs> Let's start from the right. So, Alessandra. <laughs> So, it, oops, it's a pleasure. So, I'm not able to do this kind of things. So, Alessandra, okay. it's a pleasure to award you of the Galileo Galileo Medal. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have also a diploma. <laughs> Adesso lo fai tu. Adesso lo faccio io. Eh. Il terzo lo fa lui. Uh, yeah. ah, facciamo il secondo Alessandra. lo fa lui, il terzo lo fai te. Eh? Tu sei lui, la, 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 la ospite. Fulvio. Questo. C'è scritto di... Is a theoretician. Second one is for for France. Congratulations. And uh, which one is? Uh, we don't know. Ah, we have this one. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Be careful. Be careful. This is for France. Okay, and now <laughs> Teobaldo. <laughs> it's my pleasure to uh, give you the medal. Uh, yes, uh, and my congratulations.